Good evening. Welcome to People's University. Uh, we are live, and uh, we're going to conclude our series tonight on uh, women's the struggle for women's rights. And as you can see from our background, the program tonight is dedicated to Justice Ginsburg. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have added this. We, we typically have been giving away uh, a relevant uh, sort of door prize to people who ask questions. We'll, we'll put those names in a hat and draw randomly. One of you will win this radical tea towel uh, dedicated to Justice Ginsburg. Uh, so just make sure you ask a question in the comments field, as you all have been doing right along, so you know what to do. Uh, next week at Lunch with Books, the West Virginia Poet Laureate Mark Harshman will be here for our Wheeling Poetry series. He will do a reading, but he will also be grilled uh, with difficult questions about his, uh, let's say, movie and book preferences and things like that. He agreed to do that. So that'll be something different on Tuesday at noon. And uh, our next People's University will start in January. And uh, I'll just say now that it will be science-based and there's more to come. Our guest this evening, is Carrie L. Stone. She is a professor of law at Florida International University. She teaches employment discrimination, employment law, labor law, contracts at the College of Law. And uh, she had her got her BA in English and comparative literature from Columbia University, magna cum laude. She received her Juris Doctorate from NYU, uh, where she was named a Robert McKay scholar and served as the developments editor editor of the NYU Journal of International Law and Politics. Here is Carrie Stone. Thank you so much. Um, I am so honored to be speaking to you. I think this program is absolutely state of the art and I'm so grateful to Sean and to Professor Anne LaFaso for introducing me to it. Um, I was asked kind of um, just last week to say a few words about Ruth Bader Ginsburg to whom this program is dedicated um, to her memory. And um, I wanted to speak just briefly about a few themes in, of her life and her work and hopefully of her legacy. Um, I was privileged to have met her um, briefly in the, my capacity as chair of the American Association of Law Schools section on women in legal education, which I chaired and she had also chaired um, when she was a law professor and a bunch of us were invited into her chambers to present her with an award. And um, she, it was supposed to just be a few minutes. She invited us in, she was warm and wonderful and so excited to entertain all of us. And um, it was very, it was very meaningful. It was so meaningful that I, I took the trip as a new mom on maternity leave and my husband and baby waited outside and it was, it was special. So I, I'm privileged to be speaking to you about her tonight. Um, just briefly, I, I think a few of the themes of her life and work that we should reflect upon this week, especially, our number one, um, resilience. Just, I've been thinking a lot about being resilient this week as a mom of little kids, you know, in virtual school and teaching Zoom classes at FIU and just what everyone's going through and what life looks like as opposed to what it used to look like. And I think we can all learn a lot from Justice Ginsburg, um, thinking about her indomitable spirit. Um, every time we heard about one of her setbacks on the news that broke our hearts lately, it was always, but she's back at work. She's back at work. She's working from the hospital. She's phoning in. It, we, we were just so um, struck, I think all of us, by her resilience and her commitment to not only her work, but her family and, and her country. And it's very inspirational. Um, I think another piece of her legacy is going to be her very clever and effective approaches to advocacy, because before she was a justice, she was an advocate. Um, and she appeared in front of the Supreme Court and brought cases um, on behalf of largely a lot of male plaintiffs at the beginning, um, male plaintiffs bringing equal protection cases to highlight discrimination against women but to bring it to the judges. I always tell my students, when you present a case to a judge, you're, you're selling them um, your vantage point and kind of introducing them to the idea, this radical idea of, of women's equality um, in and out of the workplace by having them view the problem through the eyes of a man who was impacted. Because the truth is that women's rights are human rights and what happens to women happens to all of us. So 
For example, in 1973, she compellingly highlighted the stark inequality of preventing husbands of military wives from, from receiving the same benefits that the widows of male soldiers received. And it seems like such an obvious thing now, but that, that was not happening. And by bringing the case on behalf of um, a male plaintiff, she was able to make people see and recognize what they had failed to before. So I think her effective and powerful approaches to the exposition of inequality um, were just exquisite and that's something we should think about. And then just a final theme to reflect upon tonight is her injection of legal realism into the law, whether it was in an opinion or in one of her notorious dissents. Um, she, and I, I can speak largely about workplace law, that's what I teach, but just to give quick examples, you know, she dissented in the famous Supreme Court um, case of Ledbetter versus Goodyear, which was really a case, um, just quickly, about um, statutory interpretation and statutes of limitations and technical things, right, that we don't think about a lot, but it was about when you could bring a case and when it was too late to bring a case, to put it simply. And the court basically told this plaintiff that even though she might have a valid claim, it, it was just too late, she'd waited too long, and she hadn't waited all that long. And her argument was about, well, I'm being paid less and there's pay inequality. And every time I get a new paycheck, it's it's a new fresh reminder to, to kind of wake me up and jolt me and tell me that it's happening. So why is my time run out? And Justice Ginsburg was so powerful um, in her dissent there. Um, she really pointed to the reality that, that pay discrimination is pervasive. And that if you look at how it actually occurs, it occurs incrementally. And it occurs behind a wall of opacity. In other words, it's not so easy when you're in the workplace, when you're in the, the thick of the weeds there, to even realize that, that you're being paid less than a similarly situated man. And that by the time you kind of figure all that out, um, maybe your time is up, as Lily Ledbetter's had, had been deemed. And so this, this very strident, very powerful dissent um, wound up being very effective. Uh, Justice Ginsburg said the court does not comprehend or is indifferent to the insidious way in which women can be victims of pay discrimination. She called on Congress to rectify the situation where the court had failed to, and they did. In 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was enacted. So that was pretty powerful. Just one last example in a case called Vance v. Ball State. Um, the court was called upon to talk about this notion of, well, you know, if you're sexually harassed by a supervisor, that's significant. So it's it's um, advantageous to your case if you can show that the person who committed the harassment was a supervisor. So the question became, well, who's a supervisor? What does it mean to be a supervisor? And the, the court was split between this idea of a more broad conception and a very narrow conception where you were only a supervisor if you could do certain things and you had certain powers. And technically, if you didn't have those things, you would not be a supervisor. And Justice Ginsburg said, you know, we have to look again at these permeating workplace realities. What does it mean for someone who's working a shift at a fast food place to be sexually harassed by her shift manager who may or may not technically have all these requisite powers to fire her at the end of the day, but who casts a cloud over her existence by messing with her hours, by messing with, with her terms and conditions of employment, of employment, by messing with her. And so if we think about this more broadly construed, we will capture more of what the statute intends to capture. So again, she's advocating for that broader conception and that injection of legal realism into our jurisprudence, which is so critical when you're talking about the workplace. Um, I could say a lot more about her. We, we all could. I'm going to I'm going to stop there. But I, I just I think she um, I will always you know think about her resilience and her outreach, whether it was sort of across the, the um, political spectrum. She had friends from from all all walks and um, she had a very um, powerful effect. Um, and she also showed that you can accomplish a lot um, without being, but with precision. That's, that's something I also had heard from people who had worked for her, that she really demanded precision with language and um, just decency. So I'll leave that there. Um, oh, I love that, Anne, I love that. Um, so I'm gonna quickly segue into the Me Too movement, which I wanted to talk about tonight. And I'm gonna focus largely on the workplace, but we'll talk about the movement more generally first. Um, 
The essence of the Me Too movement is really encapsulated in the two words, Me Too, right? Literally, it wasn't just you. This is all around us. This is systemic and structural. You are not alone. And how powerful is that? So the idea is that when you have each victim of sex-based discrimination, harassment, abuse, or assault, believing that her experience was unique or even perhaps somehow a function of her own choices, you have this culture of inaction, victim blaming, and shame that is just proliferated. But with a shared understanding that this movement provided that these incidents are so common that they are allowed to happen, often without consequence, women become empowered to break the silence surrounding them. All too often, and we've seen this in the news in high profile cases, you have these concentric circles, right? These expanding concentric circles of silence that shrouds sex-based abuse, harassment, and discrimination in and outside of the workplace. The perpetrator at the center of the circle is counting on the intimidation um, of, of the people around him, usually him, not always, but usually, um, and people's fears of being blacklisted, retaliated against, um, and their desire to avoid consequences, so they will keep this quiet. It will be an industry secret. Secret. It will be a wink, wink, nod, nod. We don't talk about that. And that is what has allowed sex-based abuse, discrimination, harassment, and even assault to continue in and out of the workplace. So the Me Too movement was actually founded in 2006 on MySpace of all places by Tarana Burke. It was originally created to support survivors of sexual violence and specifically um, girls and women of color who were in a program that Ms. Burke was running. Um, but we really started to hear about it more globally um, on Octo in October of 2017 um, when a, a, um, on social media, right? This hashtag, Me Too, went viral. Uh, actress Alyssa Milano tweeted a proposal that why don't we have women who have been victims of sexual harassment or assault? And it's interesting that she combined those because you know, one is the, you know, the root of a civil action that you bring against your employer and one is a crime. But, but we can we, we could have a class on that. Many of the same problems underlie both. And she said, why don't, if you've been the victim of either of these things, write me too, to show the magnitude of this problem. And it was staggering. According to Facebook, in less than 24 hours, you had 4.7 million people around the world engaged in this Me Too conversation. Um, you had 12 million posts, comments, and reactions, and something had been ignited. Um, rumblings that had taken place at low levels in private spaces, shrouded by silenced and often misplaced shame, grew louder and were made more public. Facebook reported that more than 45% of people in the US are friends with someone who posted a message with the words, me too. Um, just think about that for a minute. Um, in the wake of all this, you had the, 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 the um, coincidence of several high profile sexual harassment and abuse workplace-based scandals that were breaking. You had titans like Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, Harvey Weinstein that were being publicly accused of these Me Too moments. And we started to hear talk of a national reckoning. Um, afterwards, a group of women in Hollywood created a movement called Time's Up, which was aimed at fighting harassment and that later led to the creation of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which was formed to help survivors of sexual misconduct, especially those in low wage industries and obtain and um, procure legal representation. Um, the Me Too movement itself has become a fixture in, in pop culture, in conversation, and it has engendered several concrete systemic changes. Uh, for example, there's a study at Yale that showed that Me Too caused a 7% increase in the reporting of sex crimes in the U.S. within the first three months after the movement went viral on social media. And with the momentum of this movement came legislation from several states, including California, New York, New Jersey, and others, um, that sought to prohibit or at least limit the use of non-disclosure agreements, so-called NDAs in sexual misconduct cases. If you'll recall, and we'll talk a little more about this later, um, you know, in the Weinstein case and other cases, you had victims and, and even witnesses 
who were prevented from speaking out because they had signed these very high stakes non-disclosure agreements. Um, and then of course, you had the backlash and we have to talk about that. In a 2018 study, it was reported that more than 10% of men and women said they thought they would be less willing than previously to hire attractive women. 22% uh, of men predicted that men would be more liable to exclude women from social interactions such as after work drinks and nearly one in three men reported they thought they might be reluctant to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a woman think about a career trajectory and what you need to have a successful one and you can see how deleterious that is uh, we're going to talk more about that too um, at the end if we have time and i want to come back to that um, i have to talk about the backlash but the takeaway i think here is that these conversations are occurring and victims are feeling more emboldened to speak out out. And these concentric circles of silence, these shrouds are being lifted. So that's a very positive thing. Um, and with that, we turn our attention to the workplace. So we all know the numbers still aren't what they should be, right? Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, was obviously passed in 1964. And we've had so much time since then to make gains, to, to make change, and yet um, women make up 46.5% of the workforce and less than 8% of its top leadership. Um, the very highest upper echelons of power, prestige, and compensation are largely devoid of women, certainly at a level that's proportional to their representation in the world um, or the workforce. So we have a long way to go. I wanted to talk just briefly about Title VII and what it's supposed to do, and then I was gonna kind of list off for you um, a few movements in workplace law that led to the opening up of, of the kind of the Me Too movement, and then a few things that we still need to think about as we move forward, and then I'll conclude. Um, so Title VII um, is the anti-discrimination statute that regulates the workplace, and I always tell my students it governs the workplace. It doesn't govern, you know, theoretically, it doesn't govern our thoughts. It doesn't govern what we do outside the workplace. It's not a so-called civility code. Courts have, have repeatedly intoned that. It's not a civility code, but it's there to make sure that when decisions are made in the workplace about who gets jobs, who gets paid, who gets promotions, basically things that turn on um, people's terms, conditions, and privileges of employment, that protected class membership is not factored in. So we protect people. Um, basically, it says that you cannot discriminate against someone with respect to the terms, conditions, and privileges of their employment because of, and the whole statute really largely hinges on those two words, because of the individual's race, religion, sex, color, or national origin. Um, and so those are the five. There are also federal statutes that ban um, discrimination against other groups, such as um, veterans, the disabled, um, people over 40. So there are other groups that have been protected by federal statute, but kind of the centerpiece of the, um, the civil rights workplace legislation is Title VII. And under Title VII, again, you can't discriminate. And again, discrimination does not have to be intentional. Um, so I always tell my students, you know, if you, if you do something, if you say to someone, um, oh, I see that you're pregnant, so um, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about this, and, and I'm gonna change the rules for you here, and I'm not gonna send you out on this big client meeting. You may have beneficent intentions, you may not think less of them as a person, but you are treating them differently because of their protected class membership. So that would count as discrimination. Um, under Title VII, we basically have two primary causes of action. One is disparate treatment, where you, the plaintiff alleges, I was treated differently because of, and it's intentional discrimination. Again, meaning that the act is intentional, not that the discrimination is intentional or necessarily accompanied by animus or vitriol. And then the second cause of action is disparate impact, where a plaintiff can actually allege, look, I don't know if you meant to do this or not, if it was intentional, but you have this practice or policy that um, as a general matter disproportionately affects members of this group. So if you have your um, board of directors meetings always on Friday night, then you have disproportionately um, reduced your 
chances of getting somebody who's Jewish or observant Jewish, uh, let's say, to um, be a part of that board. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be done on purpose or intentionally at all, but those are kind of the two primary vehicles. And um, we'll talk a little later about sexual harassment and other types of class-based harassment that are recognized under the statute as well. The statute also has an anti-retaliation provision, which any good statute worth its salt should have so that people do not feel afraid to avail themselves of it. Um, and so that if, if you do make use of it, um, it is unlawful for your employer to take action against you. And that's, that's crucial as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basics of Title VII. I always um, suggest that my students, when they're thinking about discrimination, think about kind of, is this ethical? Is this rational? There is such a thing as rational discrimination. And it, you know, is this lawful? Those are distinct questions. So that discrimination could be rational and still be unlawful. For example, uh, men and women have biological differences. Um, women can get pregnant, men cannot. Women on the actuarial tables, it is shown, live longer than men do as a group. So um, for example, if you have a defendant employer who's being sued because they are paying they're requiring women to pay more toward their own insurance for the simple reason that they just want to give the same to everybody and the women's costs a little more because of those pesky actuarial tables, even though that's completely rational and not rooted in any kind of animus, it's unlawful. Um, so I always tell my students try to separate out what's going on. Um, and there are some defenses um, that I won't get into tonight because we're not doing a whole class on it, but there's some, some pretty interesting defenses to some discrimination, but they're, they're limited as you would imagine. Um, so I want to kind of tick through this list I have of some things that kind of paved the way for this um, exposition of inequality that the Me Too movement became in and outside of the workplace, but I'm going to focus on the workplace. Um, the first is the recognition that pregnancy, that pregnancy discrimination is sex discrimination. And if you can believe it, this actually was a battle. Um, the Supreme Court in the 1970s had actually held that if you discriminate against somebody because they're pregnant, it's not because of sex. It's not sex discrimination. It's discrimination against people who happen to be pregnant. And again, it's that sort of the blinders on and the this notion of the, the, the realities don't, don't sort of seep in. Um, and it, it took the passage, it, it took Ruth Bader Ginsburg's advocacy and um, to get to the passage of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, which authoritatively stated, yes, pregnancy discrimination is in fact discrimination because of sex. And that was that was progress because again, we had had the Supreme Court saying that, it, um, and you often get kind of interesting back and forth conversations between Congress and the, you know, whoever's seated on the court. So you, you get those interesting back and forths. Um, the second kind of heartening moment that sort of paved the way for the Me Too movement in the workplace is the idea put forth by the Supreme Court in 1989 that evidence of sex-based stereotyping is in fact evidence of sex discrimination. And again, this would have seemed to be pretty obvious, but we needed the Supreme Court to say it. That's kind of an interesting case. I'll talk about it just for a minute so you guys know about it. Um, in 1989, um, Anne Hopkins, um, her, the, the decision was, was published in 1989, but in the 80s, Anne Hopkins was up for partnership at Price Waterhouse. And as you can imagine, if you kind of do the math and reverse engineer you know, back her life, um, she had been one of the few women um, with the um, combination of the education, the credentials, the skills and the inclination to rise high enough in a company like Price Waterhouse to be considered for partner. The, the numbers, if you look at them, were stark. They were of their partnership, which was several hundred people. There were hardly any women. Of the candidates who were up for partner that year, I believe she was the only woman. Um, it was, there, there was a lot of systemic um, sex-based uh, structural discrimination going on. Other types of discrimination as well, but this case focused on sex, but certainly other types as well then, um, I know. But, um, she was up for partner and she went through the process and, and the consensus seemed to be from the record that she was very qualified to be a partner. She had done excellent work, but she was difficult. She was abrasive um, and she was somewhat, she appeared to be somewhat masculine to some of the people evaluating her. So much so that when they submitted their comments about her, the comments said egregious things like, 
she should walk more femininely, talk more femininely, wear more makeup, wear more jewelry. Um, if she wants to be effective, if she wants to join our ranks, these were the types of criticisms that were levied at her. She wasn't the right type of, and they use this phrase, a lady partner candidate. Um, and the court couldn't let that go. So it, it's really interesting because even though employment is at will, you can hire and fire and promote pretty much however you want, so long as you don't engage in prescribed protected class-based discrimination. As uh, you know, I always tell my students, you have the background of at will, and then atop that background, you have engrafted these statutes that prescribe certain classes of discrimination. Um, so pretty much as long as they weren't engaging in you know, pre um, prescribed discrimination, they had the ability to, to judge her personality, to decide she wasn't a good fit, to decide she was too abrasive. And yet the court stepped in and said, no, what happened here was um, sex discrimination. And we have the evidence in, in the way you stereotyped her as too masculine of a woman. Um, so we understand that um, evidence of sex-based stereotyping can be powerful evidence toward proving um, sex-based discrimination. And you hear talk even now in academic circles of, of the Hopkins double bind, right? That if, if the ideal worker, if the person that we put up as the ideal candidate, whether we explicitly say it or not, has all of these masculine attributes, um, and we picture the ideal partner sort of physically, you know, strong and, and, and aggressive or authoritative or just sort of manly, then a woman who acts like a traditional woman, that stereotype will be deemed too feminine, too, and we've probably all you know heard these terms, too weak, hysterical, all the things they say about women. She's so nurturing, she's so nice, you know, um, but she won't make the cut, right? And so you have then if she's if she decides to kind of own it and, and be a little bit more assertive then she runs the risk of being told to walk more femininely, talk more femininely, um, be a little more gentle. And, and that's this, this double bind, right? Um, that women find themselves in in the workplace all the time. So the Hopkins case was pretty significant in 1989. That said, um, one of my research projects was to kind of look at the legacy of this case, because you think after this, all right, everybody kind of knows now, you know, how this is going to work and how it can protect men and women who are viewed as, you know, not the right type of whatever they're supposed to be. And courts all over the place with respect to who is the next Anne Hopkins. And I can give you some, if you have time, I think a few quick examples to show you some of the confusion that's erupted in the wake of that case. Um, I teach my class a case about someone who was um, investigated for sexual harassment. It was a he said, she said, and he wound up being fired. And what they essentially said to him at the end of it was, look, whether, whether you did it or not, you're the guy. So everyone thinks you did it. You probably did it anyway. So, you know, and they had the right to do the investigation. They had the right to terminate him. Um, even if he hadn't harassed her, they had employment is at will. But the question became, is this sex discrimination? And again, here's, here's echoes of Ginsburg. Is this discrimination against a man, sex discrimination? Because they literally said to him, you're a man, you probably did it anyway. And even if you didn't, people will think you did. Um, is he now too much like a man, the way Ann Hopkins was? Um, and in that case, there was a lower court decision um, and then and it was reversed. Um, so, you know, you know, reasonable minds can differ. In a second case, you had a male substitute teacher who had been accused of acting, nothing criminal, I believe, but just sort of a little over the top with some of the female students. And when they terminated him, they said he was too macho. And he, of course, you know, his lawyer, though, this is the next Dan Hopkins. He is too masculine a man and she's too feminine a woman. And, and they all invoked Hopkins. They all cited it. And in, in the case of the substitute teacher, they said, um, no, you're not the next Dan Hopkins. You did something inappropriate and somebody misspoke and said something off the top of their head that was not part and parcel of the decision. And a dissenting judge said, well, how do you know what, you know, don't we have to take this to trial? Um, don't we have to, you know, because sometimes, and I should have said this before, but the judges, when they talk about these cases, are often looking at them in terms of, is there enough here to go forward or do you just have no case? 
And um, in the case of the guy who was told you're a guy, so you probably said it anyway, his case was permitted to continue. Um, the, the Court of Appeals said, you know what, there, there is enough here. The lower court got it wrong. You can go forward. You might be the next Dan Hopkins. In the case of the substitute teacher, they said, no, as a matter of law, we don't need to go any further. That's not what happened to you. So there's still this tension, this confusion about how to use evidence of stereotyping. But that kind of leads me into my next topic, which is this idea of the, of the sex plus claim. So we recently in June of 2020 had the Supreme Court come out and definitively, authoritatively tell us that um, sexual identity and sexual orientation discrimination are both because of sex and they fit squarely within the protections provided by Title VII. We did not get that definitive statement until just a few weeks ago in June, this just June 2020. Um, prior to that, there were cases brought by people who either alleged that they were homosexual or deliberately did not allege that they were homosexual, but tried to argue that they too, like Ann Hopkins, were considered the wrong type of man or the wrong type of woman. And they had to kind of cram these claims that should have been simple enough to allege were because of sex into this mold where the courts were wildly split on whether that would qualify. Um, so that's sort of another interesting um, take on Hopkins that, that, that um, gay plaintiffs were using her case to varying degrees of success. There was not consensus. Um, but we did have that, that victory for civil rights um, in June of just this year with regard to the um, LBGTQ community. Um, another sex plus claim that was recognized just in the past 20 years that hadn't been recognized before is this idea that women with small children were recognized as a discrete class. So that if you came into the office one day and said you were expecting triplets, and this is from a real case, and the boss said, oh, bless your heart, that's wonderful. And then in the next breath said, you know what, I'm gonna take some of these responsibilities away from you because I'm not sure you're gonna be able to handle them and I'm gonna give them over to someone else. Even if that someone else were female, courts started to realize this was a discrete and unique um, variety of essentially sex discrimination. So these were all kind of strides that were made, inroads that were made, um, even prior to, except for that Supreme Court case I just mentioned, all of which were prior to the Me Too movement. Um, so there's a lot to be happy about, um, but there's also a really long way to go. And I'll just quickly tick through a few of the many um, indicators that we have a long way to go. Um, one is, and these are just some things I've identified. Some I have a book coming out soon, and some of these are discussed in the book in, in much more detail. But um, what I call judicial shortcuts are a problem. So, right, so you have judges that are granting summary judgment on cases. They're deciding which ones get to go to a jury and which ones are going to be disposed of. Um, and they do that by kind of looking at the case and seeing if there's any way that a, that a reasonable juror could say, okay, you win. And if there's not, then it doesn't make sense to let it go forward. Well, the problem is with discrimination cases, since the beginning of discrimination cases, there's this disproportionate um, amount of summary judgment. Um, this And what some often refer to as sort of a premature foreclosure of cases that might be viable. And the way that a lot of judges do this is by using what I call judicial shortcuts. So there are these little doctrines that are just kind of built into the law that nobody much really questions, but that are highly questionable. So for example, if you bring a discrimination case, a race case, a sex case, any kind of case, and you can actually bring forth as part of your evidence, because again, keep in mind, the person you're accusing of discrimination, it's an undisclosed, usually, I mean, if you have a smoking gun, then you're gonna win, but so usually undisclosed mindset that resides in the brain of the person that you're accusing. So it's, you have to use extrinsic evidence to show that, you know, this wasn't just random, this wasn't because of merit, this was because of my protected class status. And in sex cases, it's because I you know, was a man or a woman. Um, if you can come forth with evidence that says, um, I actually heard this person make a, a joke that was insensitive to people of my race a few weeks ago, or I heard this person make a comment about women um, a few months ago that should, in the minds of a lot of reasonable people, corroborate what you're saying at least enough to give some insight that maybe there's something there. And that's really what you need, is that maybe a reasonable person who hears everything could say, you know, I do think that's that's what was motivating it. Um, There's something called the stray comment doctrine has been invoked by judge after judge after judge to say, look, 
we can't bring in all these stray comments unless the decision maker was talking about the plaintiff in the context of the firing or the failure to promote or whatever we're in court about, we don't really want to hear it. And we're going to use the absence of, of evidence as a way to get rid of the case. So we're going to excise and dismiss. Same actor inference. Um, where courts kind of give this, it's a rebuttable presumption, but they sort of give this presumption of, well, you hired this woman. So clearly we're not, you know, we, we, we presume you're not discriminating against her because she's a woman or you hired this um, Southeast Asian person. So we're gonna presume that you're not discriminating against them because they are Southeast Asian. And there's really no reason, un unless you can rebut it, you know, we're gonna give them a pass. And that rebuttable presumption is problematic because let's face it, there are a lot of things that could happen between the time someone is hired and the time an adverse action happens. Um, the hiring in the first place may not have been as beneficent or legitimate or well-intentioned as we might wanna think. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to say, um, maybe this shouldn't be an inference, but these, these doctrines are used to get rid of cases and that is problematic still. Um, I have just a few more minutes. I'm going to just take through the rest of these. Um, another is despite the, um, I talked before about family responsibility discrimination and the plight of, you know, saying of mothers in the workplace and how if you're, if someone is prejudiced against you at the outset because they know you have small children and they assume you won't be able to do your job with, you know, well enough, that's problematic and you can sue. But, uh, oh, thank you. But um, the problem is, if you are a mom of small children and you actually are late a few times or you have a sick kid and you need to stay out or, you know, you need a little extra maternity leave than you're supposed to take with those triplets, um, there really aren't actual protections that accommodate you. So what do we have? We have the FMLA, which grants certain workers, um, it guarantees them 12 weeks off with um, continuity of employment and benefits, and then a return to their job or a similar job, but that's only some employees, right? It's not everybody. Um, oh, thank you, <laughs> that's so nice. Um, it's unpaid, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be unpaid. I always tell my class, the law is a floor, not a ceiling. So if an employer wants to go above and beyond and give paid leave, that's awesome. But the requirement is only that it be unpaid leave. So that's problematic. And there's no accommodation for parenthood. There's no accommodation for pregnancy. In fact, the Supreme Court famously said just in the past over, I think it was 2000 and just past few years that the, I don't want to say the dates, I'm not sure, but um, the Supreme Court said, we don't want to give pregnant women a most favored nation status. They get no extra breaks. They're entitled to whatever we would give someone who had a limitation, short-term limitation, anyone else in the office, but nothing more. They're very careful about that. So it's not so easy to be a mom in the workplace. And, and when you think about, we talked before about this concept of the ideal worker, this person who you know, we envision when we think of the perfect person to hire or promote or kind of have around, um, a lot of, you know, we have statistics and studies that show that the lion's share of parenting falls on women. The lion's share of domestic and household responsibility still falls on women. And this stuff is largely incompatible with this notion of the ideal worker. Um, and there aren't, a, you know, the FMLA was was considered, you know, watershed when it was passed and we still have it. Um, FRD was considered a big deal when courts started to recognize the doctrine of family responsibility discrimination. But these are limited protections. Um, FMLA is limited and it's unpaid. FRD only protects you from the perception that you won't, you know, will need extra help, not from the realities if you do. So it is so easy to fire people and get rid of people nonetheless. Um, so that's another problem. And then um, I would also, and it actually it disproportionately affects people of color. It disproportionately affects a lot of communities that we need to see much more represented in the workplace. Um, so workplace bullying has always been kind of close to my heart. Um, I've written about it and I've, I've sat on panels that discuss it. It gets sort of dismissed a lot. It gets sort of seen as people think bullying, they think of kids on a playground, they think toughen up and, you know, rugged Americans and, and all that stuff. And if you don't like it there, go somewhere else. And I've had students actually say these things in my 
classroom, um, just innocently, even just, you know, if it's not a good fit, just go somewhere else. And they don't realize that, yes, granted, okay, if you have, if you have someone who is messing with people because of their protected class status, whether that's sexual harassment, racial harassment, religious harassment, um, that's gonna be a problem under Title VII and that's gonna be actionable. But if you have the so-called equal opportunity bully who's just a generic jerk to everybody, there's no need for protection and we don't have protection anywhere except Puerto Rico who actually just passed something, which is wonderful, but none of the states have passed anything yet. Um, and people are, are kind of fine with that. But the, the issue is people don't realize you may have someone who technically is not using a racial epithet or is not propositioning someone because of sexual desire inappropriately, but the abuse that that they hear, or it may not be absorbed the same way by men and women, depending on the social conditioning of these, you know, and we, and again, workplace realities, Justice Ginsburg, if we look at workplace realities, if we look at life realities, sometimes men and women handle things differently as groups, not as individuals, as groups. And so when we don't protect people from workplace bullying, what we see is a disproportionate number of women that one way or another, they get winnowed out. It's not even necessarily that they all get fired because they can't handle the bullying, although that does happen. But you have women leaving the workforce and they may tell people or even think themselves, I made this choice. I just didn't want to deal with it. That's the way it is there. And I just didn't want to deal with it. And they don't realize that, that the structural discrimination is so deeply ingrained in the workplace that what they perceive as their own inability to, to you know, to make it or, you know, to, to come through is, is actually just them being decent and and people kind of behaving in in this way that 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 men as a group are more acclimated to handling, um, and that's very quiet. It's very silent. It's an undercurrent. You don't have people who step. You don't have people who step forward and identify as victims of bullying to begin with, and you you also even you have a lot of people who don't realize that they've been victims of bullying. They think they've just been put through the ringer like everyone else, and they don't want to deal with it anymore. They think it's their choice. Um, and then finally, I would talk a little bit about um, the NDAs. The NDAs, the non-disclosure agreements, are really a problem. Um, how many celebrities have we heard of, you know, that make people sign these NDAs and nobody can talk about them? Um, you know, when we when we talk about workplace bullying, I always say one there was there was a major turning point a few years ago when the whole country for like a minute was talking about. I don't know if you guys remember. Um, certainly in Miami, we were talking about it. Richie Incognito from the Dolphins and this big bullying scandal that had beset the team, and that um, a very famous uh, football player who seemed to have it all, including a Stanford education and just a tremendous amount of talent, had simply walked away because he couldn't take it anymore. And for like a minute, everybody at the water cooler was talking about, well, if, if this guy could be bullied, then maybe this is really a problem. Um, and so we got people to care for like, a, for like a microsecond. But it's harder when these things play out on big stages. When you have Harvey Weinstein in the NDA, everyone gets very outraged. But when you have the night manager at, at you know, a big box store that's being abusive or bullying and it's disproportionately hitting women, it's harder to get people to care. It's harder to get that traction that you need to pass legislation that a lot of us believe would help with the hiring and retention of more talented women. So that becomes difficult. Um, you know, we, we've seen the fall of a lot of these. It happens to have been largely men um, who've engaged in this behavior and sort of insulated themselves with these NDAs. And we've seen them sort of come, the walls come tumbling down as more people stepped forward and said, me too. But we really have to understand, um, and I think this is how I'll kind of wrap up, but this is really the tip of the iceberg. Um, we live in a culture that is still rife with victim shaming. There are still these impacted um, power structures that are in place that people don't want to mess with. Um, you know, you, you get one go around, you get one reputation. People aren't willing to put themselves out there. And you have the perpetuation of these cycles of abuse in workplaces, in industries. Um, and again, just like we all cared about Richie Incognito, but some of these more anonymous people, it was harder to get the traction. It's the same thing with this. When it's Matt Lauer, everybody's paying rapt attention. Um, but when this stuff is going on at other levels, it's harder to, to, to grab and keep that stage. So I think what we've seen is significant, 
But I also think it's the tip of a very large iceberg and that we really do need to deal with the problem of NDAs. There's, like I said, there's been some legislation, there's been some proposed legislation to limit their reach. Some have advocated and said that they should be sort of um, un rendered unenforceable because they um, exceed the parameters of, of what public policy would allow. Um, and that that is very problematic. And then the, the last thing I'll say is um, another challenge that we have is really this this backlash um, against the Me Too movement. And I think we have to talk about that. Um, there are men in every industry who were who were good men, who were nice men, who were people that you who would never um, abuse or harass anybody, and people that you like, who if you got them alone and got them to be honest, would tell you that they think twice before they have a junior female associate come into their office and close the door to give a really good review of her work the way they would with a guy. That they think twice before they would invite her to an after work meal where they'd be seen out with her. Um, and there's so many layers and levels to this, right? Because it's, you know, with some of them, they're literally afraid that something's gonna happen. And, and that's somehow the woman's problem and fault. With some of them, they're afraid that she'll, you know, that that someone will say that something happened, whether it's her or somebody else, or people will think that something happened, even though it didn't. Um, and that there's, you know, there's room for them to be falsely accused of something or misunderstood. And these, you know, as you kind of descend through these these different beliefs, um, you'd be surprised how many people have them and how many people who we think of as good people who would never engage in the behavior, but they're part of the backlash because women are losing opportunities. They're losing mentors. They're losing invitations that um, could help to launch them and promote them professionally um, when they're seen out with certain people, when they're introduced to certain people, when they have client contact and access and exposure. Um, you have men who are afraid to travel with women for work. Um, for various reasons, and and these these fears, and they're expressed with a lot of hand wringing, but but they all the consequences fall on the women. Um, I I feel terribly for a female associate who's not going to get the same intense, um, harsh evaluation of her work that will help her male colleague to grow as a professional because nobody wants to upset her or hurt her or keep her behind a closed door for too long. That's really problematic, and it's everywhere and we do need to continue to talk about the backlash of me too and how to prevent that um so i guess in summary i would say you know there, there's so much to be heartened about there's there's such a long journey in and outside of the workplace but there's so much you know still to do and that's where we come back to i think justice ginsburg and being resilient and setting about to do the work every day um thank you so much for having me i'm so happy to be here and um i'm happy to take questions this has been a real honor um, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, um, let me, uh, let me uh, let's start with this question. Willing to find my states. Um, great question. So I'll, I'll kind of blow your mind with this. Um, there is no, aside from Puerto Rico, who just passed a statute, um, there is no, in the, in the um, if you're talking about states, there's no legal definition because it's not unlawful. Harassment is def um, was defined by the Supreme Court in 1986. The Supreme Court first recognized that it was sexual harassment, but really any protected class-based harassment is actionable under Title VII if it is because of protected class status, severe or pervasive, um, if it affects the plaintiff personally, and if it would affect a reasonable person in the plaintiff's shoes. That's the legal definition for harassment. But we don't have much for bullying. There is a model statute that's online from the Workplace Bullying Institute, and it's been introduced in many states but failed to pass. The definition as it's been urged, although not adopted, is again that, um, it's a great question, is it, it's a very high threshold. It's a very high threshold because the idea isn't that we want the courts to, we don't want to open these, these, they call it the floodgates. I hate using that term, but that's what they call it, or the floodgates. So we don't want everybody kind of lining up every time they have some interpersonal blow up with someone. So um, most of the proposed statutes require, you know, you have to show concrete psychological harm that, that came from it. And you have to show really, truly egregious past the pale behavior. So there is a pretty high threshold, which is why I'm surprised that um, more places haven't passed the, the, the statute. Until this past year, no, uh, nobody had. So thank goodness for Puerto Rico. Okay. Oh, Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, um, 
Because it plays for women of color. Yes, yes. Um, absolutely. We've seen tremendous leadership um, by women of color. Um, if you think about the Women's March, if you think of all of these movements, um, and, and that brings up another point that I actually would like to, to mention, which is, which, which I think it came about as a concept a few decades ago, but we're talking about it more now, which is great, which is the concept of intersectionality, meaning that you are a member of two uh, or more protected classes simultaneously, such as being a woman of color, and the unique harm that befalls people who live at these intersections and the law sensitivity and societal sensitivity to that, which really hasn't been there. And I think that's very crucial and important to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw and her groundbreaking work on intersectionality. Alex, you can remember. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, you can all see that, right, I assume? Yeah, okay. Yeah. They, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure because I'm not just reading and then answering without them knowing. Um, um, first of all, countries, would you say the U.S. is lagging well? But, oh, sorry, can you put it up one more time? Sorry. Absolutely. Um, I have students in my seminar class who write um, these seminar papers, and I encourage them to bring in, if they have outside knowledge or interests or international comparative perspectives. I had a student a few years ago who wrote um, a paper about um, countries in South America that not only have better leave policies than we do, but that require that every employer who have um, over a certain number of women have daycare on site provided for free. Um, and that is mandated by the government. So it's again, it's a cost that's passed along to everybody by, you know, by giving it to the employers. And um, she had written, this particular student wrote a brilliant paper about the um, the benefits of, she talked about benefits of breastfeeding and how that's recognized um, in other countries and bonding and that we don't give women enough time here and that they are mandated to have time in other countries. It's often paid. Um, and then you have this, this the burden of, of childcare kind of lifted. We have to start having more of these conversations. I definitely don't think we're where a lot of other countries are and where we should be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So until 2020, discrimination because of sexual orientation was not clearly seen as falling within Title VII. Some people said, on one side you had people who said, it doesn't fall within. If you go back to the architects of the statute and the intent of the drafters, which is something you're supposed to look at in theory, um, they weren't, they did not intend to include homosexual people when they said because of sex. They were thinking mostly of women, but because they said because of sex, it could be women or men, um, but they were not thinking of them. And that, that was the thought. Now, again, I feel compelled to point out if we look at the homogeneity of Congress at that time um, in the 60s, it, it was a largely um, homogeneous group of sort of, you know, um, white males um, who did not identify as homosexual. Um, and, and, you know, we have this legislation, it's good in a lot of ways, but it's, it's a product of its time. We, we don't know for a fact what, you know, exactly was intended, but the, the thought was that some people said it was not, and they said, and it, it's not written in there. Um, they also point out, pointed out, look, the statute was passed in 64. It was amended in 91. There was a chance to stick other things in there. They did not add protected classes in there. So we have to assume that if that's what you're claiming your discrimination was based on, you're not included in because of sex. And then you had other courts and judges and advocates who said, no, this, this falls squarely within. Um, if, if you're, if you're discriminating, and this is what the Supreme Court just found a few weeks ago, so we're really living in history here. Um, you know, the earth is changing right under our feet. Um, other people have been saying forever, no, we, we recognize, you know, sex-based stereotypes and not fulfilling your sex-based stereotype and, and being penalized for that is discrimination because of sex. So, um, and I actually had a seminar student who wrote a brilliant paper years ago, um, and he did some empirical research, and he found that plaintiffs who brought cases and didn't discuss their sexuality, but just said that they were not perceived as the right type of man or the right type of woman with respect to their behavior and affect and appearance, fared better on the whole trying to make those because of sex claims, because you had to cram it into because of sex, um, than people who disclosed their sexual orientation. And he said that was horrible and unfortunate, but if you wanted to be strategic, the results, and he, he called it plead well, don't tell, which was sad, but clever. Um, and 
So it really took sort of this big split for decades and decades and decades, leading us up to the Supreme Court in a case called Bostock in June of 2020, saying, no, you cannot, it, it, you know, it, you're not, if you're just saying you're homosexual and you're a man, you're homosexual and you're a woman, if I don't want to hire either one of you, how could I be discriminating because of sex? And the Supreme Court said, that's that's a fallacy. You have to unpack what that means in order, you, you can't talk about what it means for a person to be gay without making reference to their sex sex um, because the whole idea is that it's a woman who's dating or interested in another woman, a man who is with another man. Um, so if you package it up tightly like that and don't unpack it, you get this sort of fallacious version of things. But if you unpack it, you see that you really can't get around the fact that this is at its core discrimination because of sex. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, and then Oh, that's, I mean, that's opinion. Um, yeah, the Virginia Military Institute um, had a policy um, not allowing um, women. And um, that was, that's definitely one of her most famous opinions. Um, Scalia wrote a really interesting dissent in that case. And the two of them often had this kind of oppositional tension between them. Um, but yeah, the, um, the introduction of women into, into VMI with, with the Virginia Military Institute. Um, it was a big moment in, in not just military history, but in US history, because they were one of the last colleges um, in the country not to allow women in. Um, so that's definitely up there. Oh, thank you. So nice. So nice. Where do we go from here? Oh, what a great question. What a great question. Um, look, before you can get a case in front of a court, let alone the Supreme Court, you have to embolden and empower victims to come forward. And that's just hard. It's still hard. Um, it, it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's hard to advise sometimes, depending on who the person is. If you're, you know, just starting out your career, you know, you're going to take on the power structure of this law firm or this accounting firm or this, this powerful individual. It's, it's scary. We have to make it less scary to, to come forward, whether it's to the police, whether it's to the courts, the EOC to file a claim. Um, we have to make it less scary for people. And, and the Me Too movement goes, goes somewhat of the way toward that by, again, by dismantling this fiction that we are, you know, in these little silos. And if something happened to you, you should just keep quiet and move on with your life. And that, that's not how it is. Um, so I think the first step is, is working to empower victims, creating opportunities for them, um, making sure that the anti-retaliation laws are robust and are enforced and interpreted in a robust enough way to protect them. I, I should point out here, and I always tell my class this, you know, the retaliation laws are somewhat limited because they protect you from retaliation by your employer. But if, if people are whispering about you and you try to go to a, another employer and all, and I've, and I've seen this happen to people where all of a sudden they have a bunch of interviews canceled the same week. And maybe if you Google them, you see that they brought a lawsuit. Um, it's 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 really scary. We have to create um, safe spaces for victims to pursue opportunities and not to feel like doors are going to be shut, opportunities are going to be foreclosed. Let alone, you know, so we, we've seen victims in the public eye step forward and say that they felt physically afraid. We we have to dismantle um, these these threats to them. Sorry, Carrie. Um, let's. Uh, have this last question and then we'll give away some cool things. Cool. What advice would you give a well-meaning man who wants to know? Hmm. That's a brilliant question from my brilliant friend. I think, look, I think what, what you do with one, you have to do with all. So if you're having closed door meetings with men and you're not afraid that they're going to accuse you, it's not just of, of, of a sort of sexual affront. It's of anything. I mean, if you're trusting the, the junior men that come into your office, you know, for meetings or evaluations, you've got to afford that same trust to the women that your firm is hiring. Um, I think mindfulness goes a long way. Certainly, you know, being, you know, being out in public. I mean, I've heard of men kind of planning workplace outings in, in big groups, if that's what you feel you need to do. I, I think for the, you know, professional women who are trying to advance their careers, you have to kind of trust them and 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 
as much as you would trust a similarly situated man. And if you don't, you have to kind of ask yourself why you don't. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thank you for a very informative program. Here's one of the comments we've had that it's very interesting. Everyone's very positive comments. So uh, the first thing we're gonna give away, I assume there are no more questions. Last chance. Okay. Is this pretty cool poster? I have it upside down, of course, of uh, where the suffrage prayed in 1908. So that'll be number one. And I have all the names here. So you have to trust me. Here's the winner of that. This is very, this is the dramatic part of the program. Pam. Pam and Wuziak, you've won something to go with your, your bag that you won. Okay, the next prize is uh, two free passes to the Heinz History Center, graciously donated by Bob Stakely, who's our friend at Heinz, and helped promote the program for us. So let's get a winner for that. All right. This is, uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Deb Johnny Chakrabarti. Am I saying it right? But anyway, you're the winner of that. Uh, if you could email or private message your mailing address, <laughs> Pam's happy to have won again. We'll get you that. And now for the big prize, which is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, radical tea towel. Here we go for that. I know I'd like to have it, but I can't win. The winner is Terry McDougal. Terry McDougal. So again, if you've won a prize, please send me uh, your mailing address or I can leave the prize for you at the library and you can pick it up. We want to thank Carrie for an excellent program. It went very well. I thank you for a very informative program and well presented. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended tonight. And uh, don't forget next week for Lunch with Books, Mark Harshman, Poet Laureate of West Virginia, will be grilled and Mark Harshman unplugged. Carrie, thank you again. Bye. Take care. Take care.